speaker of today, Hassan Rahim, who's going to talk about Revolution 2.0, the new face of the revolution. Ow! <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about social media as a form of entertainment. But except, not really. <laughs> social media is actually a medium for revolutions. Everyone here knows that social media played some sort of a role in the Egyptian revolution. But no one focuses on as to why it's significant to the Egyptian society and what changes it induced in the society to bring about a new existence for Egypt. Most of the world's totalitarian regimes are located in the Middle East and many Western scholars have declared them to be either immune to democracy or very resilient to change. Egypt ranks 35th in its military spending as percentage of GDP, whereas its GDP per capita remains at $6,200, placing it 138th in the world. According to Human Development Report's findings, almost 20% of Egypt's population lives below poverty line. And the stats become even more significant considering the median age in Egypt is 24. But, on a stark contrast to this, there are actually 20 million internet users in Egypt. And of that, 8.2 million are on Facebook, which is roughly 10% of its population. The socio-economic demographics including inequality, lack of power, inequality, poverty, lack of freedom, and underrepresentation of the youth made the situation ripe for the revolution because the youth was unable to actualize their potential, increasing, increasing their political frustration, which was perfect, which provided the perfect condition for the revolution. In Egypt, media is either state-owned, heavily regulated, or and every bit of information is clearly manufactured by the government. For 30 years in Egypt, people were abused and had no, no fundamental freedom of right or freedom of speech. But then came the internet. The internet <laughs> came in and gave the impression to people that actually they're not alone. There's others who have suffered the same pain and go through the same pain as they have in the last 30 years. And they, seem, uh, and they share the same dreams for the future as well. Social media is a popular alternative and has redefined our traditional relationship with the, popular, with the, with the political authority and the population. But how, how did we come about this? Because we came about this because the media that is good at creating conversation isn't really good at creating conversation. The media that is good at creating groups isn't really good at creating conversation. So we see an asymmetry here. But then came the internet. Internet is the only media which is innately good at creating community and conversations at the same time. Media now isn't just a source of information. It is also a site for coordination. The movement became by, by a Facebook page called Kulna Khalid Said, which is We Are All Khalid Said, which was created to get justice for Khalid Said and his family after he was brutally beaten to death by Mubarak security forces. This page is fundamental to the movement for many reasons. One of being it allowed disconnected people to connect and young secular minded individuals to mobilize support. This is evident from the fact that 1.5 million users of this page are 24 years old or younger, which explains the frustration and anger that was seen. Another important aspect of this page was it has a sense, it has a, it has a feeling of community to itself. People felt a sense of belonging where they can share ideas and opinions which they hadn't done before. The most fascinating aspect about this page was it brought together the very fragmented Egyptian society together. People from different religions, political ideology, cultural backgrounds were together, it was seen as together. Who would have thought while Muslims would pray, Christians would protect them, while Christians would pray, Muslims would protect them? Well, religion has been tagged as the very cause of this fragmentation at the very first place. The sole credit of this union and sole, sole credit of this union goes to the active and symmetrical participation made possible by social media because no other medium could have disseminated information at this rapid pace to all segments of society and even all segments of society and even at this fast pace. So when the investigations into Khalid Said's case hit a roadblock, people actually started posting ideas on this page, with Facebook page as to what to do next. And it was then that the administrator decided to have the idea of having silent protests in Alexandria and Cairo, which also later spread to nine other cities. But the interesting thing here is, it was for the first time people were united and determined to achieve something together. Instructions were clearly laid out on the Facebook page so, we, so as to people would know what to do when they come out on the streets. 
instructions such as stand five feet apart so as to not to break the Egyptian law against public demonstration, be absolutely silent, have no signs, wear black, which was also decided in online voting system on Facebook, was some of the instructions that was given. People were asked to stand on the banks of river or sea for one hour and then walk away. This is possible because once people start a social network, a source of a viral loop is created and from there onwards everyone wants to be part of this. This was the runaway process that led to a tipping point in Egypt and the youth was able to self-sustain from there onwards. And this is how the online conversation started. The online conversations were translated into street protests. So as the demonstration gained more and more momentum, some of the most prominent members of the Egyptian society joined the movement as well. Omar Khalid, an Egyptian preacher, noted by Times Magazine as one of the most influential people in the world, also broadcasted to his 2 million Facebook followers saying that he has joined this revolt and so should you. This gave the movement a significant push because people who are passive followers now started joining it as well. But, but then something happened. On 27th of January, Mubarak decided to ban internet and all forms of communication in Egypt. But this clearly backfired for the Mubarak regime for many reasons. One being the West saw it as a violation of freedom of speech and this legitimized the movement in favor of the activists. Another interesting reason here is the people who were passively following the revolution from the comfort of their seats, from the comfort of their home seat, now suddenly had no updates as to what was going outside their homes and they as a result started joining the revolution as well. But the most interesting twist to here is people who were actually watching unproductive videos of kittens from YouTube channels now suddenly didn't have any means of entertainment. <laughs> and as we were discovering the reasons behind the ban, they were getting really angry about it too. And this created, this was fundamental to creating the viral or mass effect that we saw in the Egyptian revolution. Egypt clearly did not account for this to happen. Rory Johns, a technology correspondent at BBC said, and I quote, for millions in a country like Egypt, the ability to get instant access to information, information which can change the shape of your lives, is becoming much more of a fundamental human right, as is the right to clean drinking water. Marshall McLuhan, a liberal Canadian technologist, argued that medium of communication shapes our very beings because, in effect, medium is the message. Medium is the message is a revolutionary enigmatic paradox, which means that in addition to the effects of the content, medium has its own effect on our thinking, on our thought process, on our behavior, and as a result, our society as well. So practically speaking, the fact that Egyptians use Facebook and Twitter to organize protests is more important than the content of these tools. McLuhan was also arguing to the fact that the medium is context dependent and works differently in different societies. So, for, so, so for the Middle East, it, turned, it amplified the social conditions of frustration, turning rage into an outrage in the form of a revolution, whereas for democratic liberal countries, it reinforced the principle of freedom of speech. McLuhan argued that over a long period of time, we tend to focus more on the things that are obvious, and it is then that we ignore the understated and the subtle changes induced in our society by the non-obvious in our society, which for our case is social media. For Egypt, these changes, included, cha these changes included blurring of the lines between private and public sector, changes in the means of production which include social, economic and political, and a sense of collective identification. These unanticipated changes were really important and fundamental to creating the revolution and sustaining the support that was needed. So the movement that started on 25th of January by February 11th Mubarak was gone. Now it is really important for us to understand as to how social media helped Egyptians realize their potential and how do we know actually that social media is more than just a form of entertainment. We know this because in May of 2008 there was an earthquake in China and the last time Chinese authorities had an earthquake of similar magnitude it took Chinese authorities three months to even admit to the fact that they had an earthquake. According to a survey done during the Arab Spring, the top hashtag on the microblogging site Twitter was Egypt and not Justin Bieber or Charlie Sheen. <laughs> Another thing that happened, a major setback for the Egyptian revolution was in 2009, Facebook released its Arabic script, Arabic script which removed the language barrier of those incompetent in English and they were able to come out and join the online conversations as well. But the most interesting thing here is when internet was banned in Egypt, Google and Twitter within no time came up with a mechanism to tweet via voicemails using the hashtag Egypt. 
this was very fundamental in getting the word out about the band on internet in Egypt to the international community. So the fact that audience can now talk back to producers of any kind of information isn't crazy enough. But the fact that audience can now talk to each other and collaborate is revolutionary and something that's going to take some time adjusting to. In Egypt, no one expected these conversations that started online to translate into, Egypt, into street protests, but Egyptians did. Youth not only uses these platforms to organize protests, but to maintain their psychological well-being as well. It is, it, is, it is evident from a quote that I took from an active social media user in Egypt. He said, and I, and I quote, It is such a relief to go on Facebook. I feel so liberated knowing there's a place I can send my thoughts. So this proved that youth growing among these tools not only develop a dependence on them, but a different mindset as well. According to a survey, when asked 65% of Facebook users in Egypt that Egypt said that Facebook was the top medium they used to stay up to date with the revolution, and 44% even said that Facebook changed their opinions or views solely or in comparison to other traditional media outlets. So therein, the government really needs to think, rethink their strategy of dealing with their population in terms of representation and protection of their civil rights. James Sorowiecki, an influential social psychologist, argued that people, when act in masses, are smarter than we think. His analogy of army ants to our virtual connections is very relevant and timely. He said that when army of ants are wandering around, they get lost, they follow one simple rule, just follow the ant in front of you, and they all eventually end up in a cycle. Similarly, Doris Graber also argued, and other media theorists also argued, that citizen participation is cyclic and depends on the seriousness of the issue. During the Egyptian revolution, we saw the largest dissemination of information from regular Egyptian citizens, not only within Egypt, but across all national and international boundaries as well. So social media in the form of Facebook and Twitter didn't really cause the revolution, but it aided in accelerating it and amplifying its effect on the international level. So the question now in your mind must be, why is it important or why should we care? We should care because the time when news and information was produced but professionals is now over long gone. Now it is the audience who is the producer and consumer of information as well. We live in the world where media is increasingly ubiquitous, social, cheap and global. So policy makers therefore should consider the policy of enhancing liberal values by mediating representation, by mediating representation using these social tools by making sure that information and participation is immediate, direct and two-way. Malcolm Gladwell, another skeptic when it comes to the role Facebook played, or role social media played in the revolution, was right in saying that revolutions do not take, take place by signing up for a cause on Facebook. It takes place by real people taking real risks. But what he didn't realize was what makes these people take these risks is the consequence of the unanticipated changes going on in our society because of our social innovations. The notion that anyone can create content and make people to pay attention to it was unimaginable in the past or with traditional media outlets. Like Wikipedia from an idea that sounded crazy to having the largest encyclopedia in the world, Egyptians, through use of their social tools, bring to us one of the most inspiring stories when it comes to revolution. Therefore, I say shukran Facebook, which is thank you, Facebook in Arabic. Um, you, you said something about, about crowds being smarter than individuals, and there's, you know, it's an appealing thought, but what you're talking about here, you, you're, you're giving the positive story of, of social media, yeah. but if you think about the kinds of complaints that many people in the West have about yeah. social media, it's not that people don't have enough information, but that the information is kittens. Yeah, that people are, they find a community around things like that, and not around ideas. Yeah. So you've got a simple revolutionary claim, overthrow the government. But after the government's gone, social media doesn't help you work out the complex issues, and that may explain some of the paralysis in Egypt. I mean, yeah. how do you respond to that? I definitely agree that it doesn't help with the future of Egypt, and that's why I didn't. I just concentrated on as how it helped you in the revolution. So my claim was that it was fundamental to the movement because it gave outlet to the youth to having outlet for their opinions, which they didn't have previously had under Mubarak's regime. So they were able to come up with ideas, like for example deciding on having silent protests. It was done through an online voting system, which they have never seen in the last 30 years. People were given a chance to vote and make a difference. People posted 10 different ideas, the administrators 
voted for all these ideas, and then the max, the one with the maximum vote decided to do that. So I agree that the future is great. It's not really as we don't know what the future of Egypt is in regards to social media and when it comes to democracy. But one thing is for sure that social media played a huge role in the revolution and in a democratic sense as well. Hassan, you, you quote that it's, I um, mean, the mean age is 24, and I uh, think back to when I was 24, and uh, the revolutions, if you let me run the world when I was 24, might not have been the best idea yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that I would have, you know, my yeah. idea. So I'm just wondering if you think that this is actually a, a good thing in the fact that there's not, I mean, when you think of the elderly and the experienced, uh, how many of them are actually on Facebook and Twitter, Definitely. and where you know are their opinions being heard? Because that's a big difference in the age group. The age group, do you think? Definitely. There's a so good almost or bad to that? almost sixty percent of the population in Egypt is twenty five years old or younger, and the median age again is twenty four. So that tells you a lot about the population demographics demographics of Egypt. And there was a lot of internet users in Egypt, but how this movement was started was through this Facebook page. But how was it conducted throughout the 18 days wasn't just done on Facebook. It was done through telecommunication services. It was done through word of mouth. It was done to people putting posters on. It was done through people using any source of resources they have just to get the word across about the revolution and about joining the movement. And another important fact here is that Farnese would argue that there were a lot of public opinion molders in that scenario as well. Like Omar Khalid broadcasting to his 2 million Facebook followers that have joined the revolution and so should you was a huge success. And the similar way, there were so many other influential people who started joining, like all his judges, senior judges of Mubarak's regime kind of started joining the revolt as well. And that was significant because they were sitting on the bench and they were passively following the revolution. But as the revolution was moving forward, many more people started joining the revolution because they were public opinion molders and public leaders who were forcing, not forcing them, but like using their, using their convincing powers for people to come and join the revolt as well. We have time for one last question, Bennett. Do you think there's a potential or even inherent danger in having a Western-owned and operated company playing such an active role in social change abroad? I definitely think this is one of the things that all the social tools, including Facebook and Twitter, are now deciding to come up with a policy of how to deal with such situations. Facebook has tried to remain mom on its role as to what it did during the revolution, but Twitter on front in the paper said, we are helping these people get their human rights, and we were founded on the principle of uh, fundamental principle of freedom of speech, and therefore we support this. So it's different with every company, but this is one thing that they're really considering right now after the Egyptian revolution. Thank you, Hassan.